got you. <laughs> Good morning. How's everybody today? So, in your uh, prayer time this week, lift up uh, Jordan and Tiffany and Jane. They're going to go see Tiffany's family. They're on their way to misery right now. Misery. Literally, the state of misery. And we'll see about the rest of it when they get back. But um, keep them in prayer. They're, they're traveling, so uh, we want to have uh, traveling mercies with them. Um, so you guys are stuck with me then for a while. So, so anyways, uh, let's go before the Lord, invite him to be here with us. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity we have to, uh, glorify you and praise your name. Lord, we pray that you would inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, we pray that you would meet us in this place and we give you all the praise and all the glory for it in Jesus name. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? Let's sing together. All I see is a battle. You see my victory. When all I see is a mountain. You see a mountain move And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am safe with you So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hand lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet. I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Jesus is nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the cross. God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hand lifted high. Oh, God, that don't belong to you. Everything I lay at your feet, I see through the night. fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our God you shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our God almighty fortress you go before us, nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Oh, mighty fortune, you go before us. 
Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of Father God, we give you all the praise and glory in this place, Lord. Today, right now, there are many who are fighting their battles in prayer, fighting battles against cancer, fighting battles against a disruption of their family, fighting battles uh, spiritually and physically, Lord God. And as we look in Acts chapter 4 today and we see, God, your ability to deliver in the midst of of our trials and troubles, pray, Lord, we remember the battle belongs to you. So, Lord, we commit all today who are fighting those battles to you and ask for your deliverance, for your healing, for your touch, for your strength, for your boldness, whatever is needed in whatever the situation is so that you be glorified and magnified. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, we have an opportunity to say hello. So find someone you know, someone you don't. Give them a hug and wel welcome them here this morning. Good morning. Look at everyone greeting each other, welcoming each other, making everyone feel like family. It's awesome. You're not going to acknowledge? 
<laughs> First off, how is everyone doing this morning? Awesome, awesome. First, I just want to also bring up and welcome all the new visitors. If it's your first time here today, welcome. If it's your second time, welcome. Third time, welcome. We want to welcome and make sure you guys feel welcomed here. Also, if you've been here a few times, if you haven't filled out one of these cards, please fill it out. And if it's your first time, you can find these cards in front of your seats to where you can fill out your some information so that way we could actually get to know you and connect. And once you take that card, if you could, through the lobby doors on the table by the coffee shop, or the coffee station, I'd probably say it better. Um, you go ahead and put it in the box over there so that way we could hopefully connect with you guys because we want you guys to feel welcomed here. We want you to feel like this could be your home. As well, I want to also mention on that same table, there's some prayer cards too. If you could, if you have any prayers actually, please feel free to fill it out so that way we can pray for you because we want June to know that we care about you guys. And that's all for my announcements. <laughs> That was quick. You can tell my wife's gone. <laughs> and I know she's not watching this neither because she's teaching right now. So she's in Astoria. So she's, uh, she's doing a women's retreat in Astoria. I think next weekend she's going somewhere else. The weekend after that, I'm not sure. She might be here. Is she gone that weekend too? She might be. She might be. So, um, so that means there's no, no announcements for the ladies. So, oh, yes, the ladies tea. Uh, now I can hear you all. <laughs> so we got the ladies tea coming up, and uh, 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 do we get the thing online so they can sign up online? So you can sign up online, ladies, if you want to go. The whole point of Kathy's skit last week was stop whining and saying the tea is not your thing. Just go hear about Jesus and hang out with your friends. It's, it's not as painful as you think it will be. So you'll have a good time. Um, also want to let you know, Men's Retreat is coming up May 19, 20, and 21. It's on um, the making of a man of God, studies in the life of David. Um, we're going to be up in Garden Valley. The signups are online as well. So guys, you can get signed up for that. I really encourage you to come. Look, I know there's a, a hundred reasons um, that maybe you come up with not wanting to come because oh, I don't know who I'll be stuck in a room with and they're probably going to snore. And I just want to calm all your fears and let you know all those things are going to happen. <laughs> so whatever you're afraid of, all that stuff's going to happen. And um, I think sometimes the whole point of our walk with Christ is to ask ourselves what's going to make you quit. So uh, I hope you'll come. I hope you'll sign up. There will be challenges, but there will also be great joy. And I, one time I, I went to a retreat and uh, was really blessed by a conversation I had with somebody. This was a few years, or, well, actually 20-some 20, 20 years ago. But I was really blessed by this conversation I had with this guy. And I remember telling the pastor at the church we were going to at the time, I was like, man, I was really blessed by this conversation that I had with, with so-and-so. And he says, well, you know how to make sure that happens again? Don't quit coming. You got to stay engaged and keep coming around being a part of it. So I hope you'll come. I hope you'll be a part of that. This should be an exciting time. I think it's only right now, as far as I know, it'll only be a, a Buell Bible Church. Does that sound like somebody fell on the roof? I hope they are okay. Uh, it's only going to be Buell Bible Church and Calvary Kimberly that are going to be up there. So, so far. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I did hear uh, Homedale might want to come out. So anyways, just so so you guys are aware, we, we hope to see you there. And then family, and, uh, yeah, family camp, June 24th that week. We're up in Stanley. Um, there's, there's so much space where we do family camp. Where we used to do family camp, it was so tight, you were like parallel parking trailers, and uh, you couldn't open your door without hitting somebody else. And it was good. I'm not saying it's bad. 
However, that place threw us out because there's too many of us. So that's not an option. So we found, we got a place in Stanley. It's lots of room. Now, I tell you this, you can still park your trailer right next to the next guy. You don't got to park it on the other side of the mountain. But if you want to be on the other side of the mountain, you can do that too. So uh, I hope you'll come out to family camp, be a part of that with us. That's in June. They miss any important dates? So let it be written. So let it be done. All right, let us take a minute, and uh, we have, I, I'm going to start worshiping, so come on up. Worship team wants like a 10-minute break now. <laughs> yeah, a couple of you guys should start walking right now. So, <laughs> so we want to make sure, yeah, so we have um, four people, uh, uh, there, I, I suppose there could be more, but four people that I know of in our fellowship that are uh, battling cancer, Randy, Chris, Ruth, and Dylan. Uh, and so we want to make sure we have an opportunity to lift those guys up. And uh, Randy's here, so why don't we lay hands on him and pour oil on his head. So Randy, come on up. Chris, come on up. Ruth, if you don't mind, I've seen you hiding in the back. I know, I'm sorry. Um, Dylan, I don't think is here, but uh, we'll still pray for him. So, uh, and then uh, if you guys want to join the elders laying hands on him as we pray for him, come on up and we'll do it. My doohickey's on. There we go. Yeah, especially on all these guys. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you right now, Lord. We lift up these infirm to you, God, and we pray, Lord, for your deliverance. Uh, We pray for continued healing for Ruth, Lord God, and your special touch. We pray for Randy, you deliver him from cancer and you'd heal his body. Pray for Chris that you would heal him and deliver him as well. And Lord, we remember to lift up Dylan right now, and we pray, God, your special touch upon him. Lord, for all of these, we seek your healing, your blessing, your touch, your anointing upon them. Give them every gift they need for the journey that yet lays before them. And we give you all the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we uh, as we go into worship, uh, we're going to be singing Psalm 46, and the point of Psalm 46 is celebrating a day when all of the uh, nation of Israel went to bed, and outside's all their enemies, and you know there's just war and battle and trouble in front of them, and. Uh, They go to bed that way. They wake up in the morning and the Lord had delivered them. And they walk out and all the enemies are gone. And so we we celebrate that no matter what's going on, the Lord of hosts, he's with us. Amen. This is super loud now.
This morning we have an opportunity to receive the Lord's Supper, so if you guys want to have a seat, we'll have the ushers come up. At Buell Bible Church, um, the way we do communion, we invite you, if you're a believer, to partake together with us. Uh, as the implements are passed out, the bread and the cup, we invite you to hold on to those and we'll partake of them together. 
after a time of worship. The word declares this in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. If you're familiar with the Passover Seder, when Jesus breaks the bread, there's a moment in a Passover Seder where something called the unity, it's a napkin that holds three pieces of matzah, is brought forward. The middle piece of matzah is taken out and broken. And it's tradition. If you know anything about Jewish tradition, sometimes they do things and they just say it's tradition. It's interesting that when Jesus did it, he said something about it. This is my body. In the unity, one napkin, you had three matzahs, the middle one taken out and broken. I would say representing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the middle one, the middle one representing Jesus, he said, this is my body broken for you. The next thing they would do is take it and hide half of it. They would call it the afikomen, that which comes later. Wrap it in a napkin and hide it. And at the end of the meal, they would go gather it together that they might receive communion together with that matzah. He also took the cup after supper. This is the cup of redemption. And he said, this cup, the cup of redemption in the Passover meal, this is the new covenant that God promised, the transformation of hearts, the transformation of hearts for Israel, the transformation of hearts for you, the transformation of heart for me. That's what it means to be born again. So Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You are heralding what Christ has done for you when we receive the Lord's Supper together. But he gives us a warning. He says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner. Now, sometimes in my past, I would think, well, I don't feel worthy today, you know, so I would skip on communion. But that's not what the text is talking about. The text is talking about the life of a believer examining himself. And recognizing if there's something in his life, he needs to confess to a savior and confess it and be right with God, have a right relationship with him. He says right here, let a person examine himself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Because if we don't do that, if we're not discerning the body and the blood of Christ, we're eating judgment upon ourselves. So I just want to encourage you. We're going to, we're going to worship. And as we worship, use it as an opportunity to uh, examine yourself. You don't have to sing. We'll keep singing. You're allowed to sing if you want to. And I, and I hope that you'll join us. But if that distracts you from examining yourself, that's more important. Does that make sense? To make sure that our hearts are right before him. For the one we're coming to, he is holy. Amen.
Let's pray over the bread. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for your son Jesus, for his body broken for me. Isaiah 53 declares that it's by his stripes we are healed, made whole, set free. So Lord, we thank you for that which you have provided for us. And we give you thanks for it. And we do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, let's partake together. Let's pray over the cup. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, that you made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. 
thank you for the redemption wrought by his blood. I thank you that his blood washes me clean. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far you have removed our transgressions from us. So God, we give you thanks. And we do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, let's partake together. When you guys got a chance, would you stand with us? Is 
my heart. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. You are worthy of it all. God, we just lift this time to you. We pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Hearts willing to receive the truth of your word and walk therein. Lord, be glorified in this place. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.
This morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 35. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed... What a noble miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in his name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak and nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard so when they had further threatened them they let them go finding no way of punishing them because of the people since they are glorified God for what had been done for the man was over 40 years old and whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported to all of the chiefs, priests, and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David had said, why did the nations rage, and the people plot vain, thing, vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their, threat, their threats and grant to you, your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. 
And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was once upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of land and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and they laid them at the apostles' feet, and they were distributed to each as anyone had need. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for this chance to uh, get together and, and take communion and, and learn your word. And Lord, we just ask that to keep your hand on Jackie and help him to teach what, he's, what he needs to. And Lord, we just ask that uh, we open our hearts and accept it, Lord. We just thank you for all your many blessings. We say it's your name. Amen. Children are dismissed. Have fun. <clears throat> so today we're going to be looking at revival in Israel and the persecution that follows it. And as we as we look at it, the things that we're looking at, they have they have application for us today. Anybody fighting any battles? So Jesus declared that all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. That's not being unfriended on Facebook, by the way. <laughs> but sometimes when you make a stand for Jesus, it costs you something, right? And so as we, as we look at this, I just by way of reminder, I want you to remember where we came from last week. We saw the healing of the man at the beautiful gate. We saw a lot of people hear the gospel. Uh, uh, remember where we were, we we're in the temple. So we're talking about Jews hearing the gospel. We see their hearts being transformed, right? We see them mourning as one mourns for an only son, right? They, they're mourning for what happened to Christ and they cry out, what must we do to be saved? And so they're saved and baptized right there in the mikvah around the temple, Around the temple area, God moves in power. And as soon as they're, they're like, oh, hey, man, this is like, trust me, if you was a preacher and the first time you preached, 3,000 people got saved. And the second time you preached, 5,000 people got saved. You're thinking you are on a mighty terror, right? God is moving. Holy Spirit is moving in power. You're thinking this is perfect, God. This is how this is supposed to go. And right about then, the guards show up and arrest you. And the Lord says, no, this is how it's supposed to go. Because that's what it looks like. If we think, I think for some of us, because we've grown up in the United States, we're, we're shocked when there's any infringement upon our rights. But everywhere else around the world, that infringement's been going on for a long time. If you preach the word, what's going to happen? People will respond to you in anger. It says, and while they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed. That's Bible speak for really mad. <laughs> what, if you watch uh, open air preachers stand on a street corner, now you might say, why does anybody stand on a corner? You're just annoying people. Well, that, that is how the gospel used to be proclaimed, right on the corner. And so you're, all they're doing is, all you got to do, if you don't like it, just keep walking, right? You don't got to say nothing. Do you think that ever happens? No, no. So they're super annoyed, it says, because they were teaching the people the name of Jesus. You can stand on a corner and do whatever you want. You can stand on a corner as a man, dress up like a woman, wear all kind of different colors, dance around, sing songs, jump up and down, and everybody will clap. But if you stand on the corner and you proclaim the name of Jesus, everyone's going to get mad. That's the way the rebellious world is toward the Lord. They're angry. Jesus said in Matthew 10, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. 
It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. For if they called the master of the house Beelzebul, remember what they called Jesus, Lord of the flies? How much more will they malign the members of his house? You, you think that they said things to Jesus, they won't say things to you? Put his name on you somewhere. Walk around and, and proclaim his name wherever you go. And you will discover. Here's what the Lord said in verse 26, Matthew 10. Have no fear of them. Don't be afraid of them. They can't do anything to you. Your, your future is sealed. What can they take from you? The Lord says, nothing is covered that won't be revealed or hidden that won't be known. God knows what you're going through and don't worry. He's a better judge than you are. But we, as his servants, we're to suit up and show up. In verse three, it says, they arrested him and put him in custody until the next day. It's already evening. The second thing you have to look forward to is arrest. Yeah, you can be arrested for doing things, for standing and for the name of Christ. And cities will develop ordinances to stop you. It has happened in Twin Falls already. It's coming. Don't worry. In Luke 21, 12, Jesus at the Olivet Discourse, you remember when we went through Matthew 24, we talked about this. Jesus said, before all of these things, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They'll deliver you up to the synagogues and the prisons. If they're delivering you up to synagogues, where's this happening? It was ha it's happening in Israel. Yeah, it's, does it still happen today? Yeah, but do they deliver you to synagogues anymore? No, no. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. Every one of the disciples is going to face that. And we're seeing it right now. Peter and, and John are facing it. They've been arrested. But many of those, in verse 4, but many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Here's what you got to hold on to. It's still worth doing. Because there are some that will accept. Not everyone will be angry. You will not always be arrested. But there are some who will accept. You remember when Jesus told the parable of the sower? There's four different grounds it talks about. Three of them don't produce fruit right? One of them does. When you take the time to herald and proclaim the name of Jesus, four things can happen. Three of them are bad. Angry, arrested, and accused. But the good one is worth it all because some are going to accept. And the Lord didn't say, go out and figure out what kind of soil to throw the seed on, did he? He said, a sower went out to so, what's our job? So, trust me, you don't know what kind of soil it is. You ever misjudged somebody, looked at them and said, I think they're this and they turned out to be that? You ever done that? Yeah, so just give up. You may or may not have what the Bible calls a gift of discernment, but one of the things that I have come to realize is a lot of times when people tell me they have the gift of discernment, they miss something. <laughs> it's kind of like pride and humility. As soon as you say you're humble, you're proud. <clears throat> so so we, 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 don't, we don't judge, we sow. We sow. Why? Because Jesus was the sower, right? And what's he sowing? The word of God. So what do we do? We sow the word of God. You don't have to have some clever story. I know guys who go stand on a corner and just read the word on the corner. And then the Lord brings those who he brings. And God does bring forth fruit from that. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen. But God can do it. He does it. It says in Acts 4, verse 5, Now on the next day, the rulers... Elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, all who were the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired them, what in the world do you think you're doing? Right? 
Now, you got to remember, we're 50 days removed from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's still on the tip of everybody's tongue. It was, a, it was a pretty major event locally, and they're still local. And so the same people who condemned Christ to the cross, now Peter and John, who were there at the arrest in the high priest's area, I remember they both went there, Peter denied, John hung out. When we look at what's going on here now, that same guy who denied is going to stand up and profess what changed in the new covenant, the Lord God Almighty promised his people that he was going to put his word in their heart. He was going to take their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And Peter, we see that transformation having taken place. John chapter 3 calls it what? Being born again, regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they, they're standing there and they're asking him, they're asking him, by what power have you done this? Now, there's a lot of things around that word power. Who's, who told you you could do this? Who told you you could preach in Jesus' name? Who told you, who gave you the power to heal a guy who is lame? What are you doing? Who do you think you are? That's what the declaration is. But look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, don't miss that phrase. God promised, the Lord Jesus Christ promised his disciples, don't worry about how you're going to answer them when you get accused, when you're brought before the courts. Don't worry about how you're going to answer them. The Spirit will give you utterance when it's time. You ever been caught in a spot and you're not sure? For example, you hear about something somebody went through and you think to yourself, I don't even know how I would have dealt with that. Well, it's all right. The Holy Spirit is not indwelling you to deal with that right now. But he'll give you the ticket when it's time. Peter, filled with the Spirit, said calmly, I love this. Peter, hyper Peter, the dude who grabbed the sword and whacked the guy's ear off 50 days earlier. You remember Peter? Peter always put his mouth. Peter always saying something like, you know, I'm the greatest, right? That Peter is standing in front of the same guys that crucified Jesus and calmly, he says, respectfully, rulers of the people and elders. That's transformation. It's not about answering how you think you ought to answer. It's about letting the Holy Spirit be your guide. My son, Joe, he's autistic. He's 26 years old. He lives at our house. I don't really bring him to church too much because, quite frankly, you'll hear things that everybody can't handle. If you know Joe... You know, and if you don't, well, come to my house and you'll find out. <laughs> um, but Joe, he when he gets all agitated and upset and he's, he's mad, and a part of the problem is his dad because his dad uh, teases him and he should stop it. Yes. <laughs> but, but Joe hasn't learned that verse yet. <laughs> so fathers, do not bring your children to, how's it go, wrath or something? Yeah. Yeah. See, you guys all know it. Yeah. All the kids know what it is. So, so I, I tease him sometimes. He gets super mad. And then yesterday I was teasing him a little bit when I got a McDonald's and, and he, uh, he's, he's hollering at me. I go, Joe, why are you hollering? He goes, Oh, you're right, dad. A soft answer turns away wrath. So you got to respond how God's leading you to respond, right? You want to get me to stop teasing you? That was a good way. If you were Joe, Joe's like, okay, dad, a soft answer turns away wrath. I'm like, oh, sorry, Lord. Sorry, Lord. I have been rebuked. He is calm. He is calm in the spirit. And I don't want you to miss that. He's calm in the spirit. He has self-control, right? Isn't that a fruit of the spirit? He has self-control and he has courage for the trial. 
He's ready. And he says, now, if we are being examined concerning a good deed, this is so cool. And if you don't know the history, you might miss it. The, con the concept is giving evil for a benefication. Oh, that's how theologians say it. Doing evil for good. And one of the things in all their mythology would talk about the visitation of the gods showing up and giving some blessing to some people and then them being mistreated and the gods wipe out the whole city. They would use that teaching to say, don't give evil for good. And so Peter starts his whole address by saying, are you mad at us because we did something good? Are you mad at us for we healed this guy? Look, look what he says. If we're being examined concerning a good deed done to a crippled, uh, already has the people on their heels. By the means with which this man has been healed, now the boldness comes on Peter. Let it be known. The same people that crucified Jesus, he's about to say to all of you who sat in judgment and all the people of, where are we at? Israel, all the people of Israel that by the name of who? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh, I've got to put this in. That you crucified and God raised from the dead by him. This man is standing before you well. Man, that's a bold witness, isn't it? That's a bold witness. He's confronting the, oppos uh, the opposition. He's saying, look, I, he had courage. He had the calm of the spirit. And he could confront them in an intelligent way that is going to create a lot of problems. He's challenged them with social impropriety or doing evil for good. Well, you arrested us and you made us stay in jail last night for doing good? That, I don't think anybody's supposed to do that. In verse 11, he says, this Jesus is the stone rejected by you, the builders, and he has become the cornerstone. Jesus Christ, the chief of the corner. Now, if you guys want to understand, this kind of helped me wrap my mind around the cornerstone. There's a lot of talk about cornerstone, and there's, there's by no means a, a hard and fast consensus on this. But when I was in Israel, one of the guides we had told me this, and I did some research, and it is at least plausible. It's not the only interpretation of cornerstone. When we think of cornerstone, we think of the stone set in a corner, but the thing about the cornerstone, if you think about it like that, it looks like every other stone. And the story in scripture is that the cornerstone was sent ahead. This is the story of the temple. The cornerstone is sent ahead. And they look at this and they're like, oh, what, is, what am I supposed to do with this? And they throw it off the side of the mountain. And then later when it came time to set the cornerstone, they hollered down at the quarry and said, where's the cornerstone? Now, if you think of the cornerstone as the keystone, to the arch, that stone is cut very different from the rest of the stones, isn't it? But it's the stone that holds the whole thing up. You take that out and what happens? Everything falls down. Everything falls down. And so here he's, he's referring, look, Jesus is a stone you rejected. He's that which holds all the pieces together. He holds it all together. <clears throat> you have rejected you have rejected the ultimate peace child. You guys ever heard of that? So there's a book. I think it's called Peace Child. Oh, Victor knows the book. So, the, so Victor will know when I butcher this story. <laughs> the idea of the peace child is there that these missionaries were reaching out to indigenous people and they're trying to connect with them the story of Jesus. And so through the interaction with the tribes, read the book, they do a lot better job with it. Through the interaction with the tribe, they come to realize a peace child. A peace child would have been a child of the, of the other tribe, uh, of the chief. And in order to have peace, he would give his child to the chief of the other tribe. 
And that would mean there's no more war between us. And the worst betrayal anyone could do would for that other tribe to kill the peace child. And through this interaction, they were able to tell the story of Jesus Christ. And here you see the, the disciples laying out. He, look, Jesus attested of good deeds, healed the sick, did all these incredible miracles, and you guys crucified him. Don't worry, though. God raised him from the dead. And he's the one who has given us. But you've rejected him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 is kind of challenging scripture when we're going through difficult times. Listen to what it says. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his footsteps. So are we supposed to follow the example of Christ? So when we suffer, we want to do it like he did, right? So listen to what he says. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled or challenged or accused, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, when he was beaten, he didn't threaten them, but he rather entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He trusted himself into the hands of his father. Can you do that today in your battle? Whatever it is, just entrust yourself into the hands of your heavenly father for the Lord of hosts is with you. We can know this for sure and he bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds we have been healed now jesus or as peter delivers this message look at verse 13 and when they saw the boldness of peter and john they perceived a couple of things one they're uneducated those bunch of yahoos they didn't know how to speak proper so they were uneducated. They perceived they were common. That word common just simply means unholy. Like the Sanhedrin and all those guys that are standing up there, that phrase for common, it's like you're, they're just normal people. They're not the elite like us. They're not the holy like us, the set apart like us. They're uneducated, they're common. And the third thing, and they've been with Jesus. And I would rather have that known than any of the other things you could possibly be known by. I'd rather be known by someone who walks with Jesus than somebody who's got a string of degrees. I'd rather be known as someone who walks with Jesus than any other accolade anybody could put upon me. I would happily be called uneducated and common if someone would say, but he's walking with Jesus. And so that's what they declare to him. When they saw the boldness, that word boldness, parousia, in the, in the Latin, the word that it's translated to is confide, or the English word confidence. Confide means with faith. So to be bold is to act with faith or entrusting yourself into the hands of him who acts justly. I'm in God's hands, not your hands. If God says you have me, then you have me. If God says you don't, you don't. Amen? So they act boldly because they had faith that they're in God's hands. And so they spoke the words that needed to be spoken. This is how we ought to conduct ourselves on a normal basis. To speak boldly, speak the truth with love, and to be able to to. Uh, have faith or trust that God we're in his hands if what I say you don't like I'm in God's hands it's okay this is where they're this is what he's delivering and so it says in verse 14 but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them they had nothing to say in opposition Peter shut their mouths what are they going to say it's just like when they lowered the man who was paralyzed before Jesus through the roof. You guys remember the story? <clears throat> they lowered the man, and in the hearing of everyone there, Jesus declared, your sins are forgiven you. And all the crowd takes a gasp. <gasps> what did he say? No man can forgive sins but God only, right? And then what did Jesus say? So you know... 
that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, watch this, rise up and walk. Now, once he got up, everybody shut their mouth. They don't have anything to say because, hey, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? That's what Jesus declared, rise up and walk. And so they see this man, they have nothing to say. But when they commanded them to leave the council, they, say, they sent him back over to jail for a minute. They have a conference with one another. They conferred to one another. And what are we going to do with these guys? We got to do something. This is a notable miracle that has happened. Everybody knows the cripple at the gate, beautiful. So everyone, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem know it, and we can't deny it. What are we going to do? But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let's just give them a stern warning and tell them not to speak in this name. So they call them together and they charge them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Now listen, you guys, uneducated in common as you may be, as the authority over all of Jerusalem and the temple area where you keep preaching every day, you may not speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered them, well, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you judge. This is a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego moment. Rack, Shack, and Benny, you guys know them? <laughs> Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, that's their Hebrew names. They're, they're standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful king in the land. There's a fiery furnace right over there, and they were just told to bow. You bow, when the music plays, you bow, I'll give you one more chance. And they respond, O king, live forever. Our God is able to deliver us from, our, from your hands, but even if he doesn't, no. What were they doing? They are entrusting themselves into the hands of God. If God gave the king authority over them, they get thrown into the fiery furnace. What happened? They got thrown into the fiery furnace, right? But there's no panic. Why? Because they entrusted themselves into the hands of God. So they said, our God is able to deliver us, but even if he don't, we don't bow. King Nebuchadnezzar is so mad, he heats up the oven seven times. They tie them guys up, throw them in the fire. The only thing burns off them is the, their bonds. And they're just walking around in the fire with one who looks like the son of God. Because Jesus was with them. Here, Peter and John, they recognize the Lord is with us. And whether you think it's right for us to listen to you or God, you judge that. But... We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They have been called of God, according to Acts 1.8, as witnesses. Isn't that what the, G the Lord Jesus told them? The Lord Jesus told them, Acts 1.8, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my, what's the word? Witnesses. What's a witness do? He witnesses. Right? He's a, we've been called witnesses. So he's like, look, if you think we should listen to you or God, I don't know, but God called us witnesses. So we have to speak about what we saw and heard. That's what a witness is. You guys are familiar with the word for witness in the Greek? Martus. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's the word martyr. What's a martyr? A martyr is someone who's been put to death for their faith or someone who's a witness who won't shut up, who cannot but speak. These are transformed men. Look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I would say that is the definition of a witness, martus holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. How do not be conformed to this world, but be how? Tran who transforms us? The power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus changes our heart and our minds are washed. We have a renewal of our mind that takes place, right? Amen? Amen. Not conformed to this world, not like everybody else, but transformed 
by the renewal of your mind that you might prove or discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So what do we do? We find ourselves as witnesses and we trust ourselves into the hands of the one who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he gives us into whoever's hands he wants to give us into for his glory and our goodness. And we trust him. And no, nobody can stop that anywhere, ever. And that's the testimony of the early church. Verse 21, and so they further threatened them. So I'm sure there was some hollering in that, right? You guys read that into that? They further threatened them. What? Listen, if you do this, don't worry, there's beatings coming, but this time they're going to turn them loose. <clears throat> and they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way to punish them because of the people for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign was 40 years, it's not some child. It's not some trick. This is the real deal. The real deal. This man is transformed by the power of Christ. Just physically, he's transformed by the power of Christ just like spiritually every man who is separated from God is made alive together in Christ Jesus. Transformation happens in every one, just like it happens to that guy. People say all the time, there's no miracles anymore. What are you talking about? Have you ever seen somebody's life transformed? That's a great miracle. The problem is we don't always get the miracles we want. Sometimes we get them, amen? Sometimes we get them, and sometimes we don't. And so people say, where's all the miracles? Well, miracles are still happening. Every time someone gets saved and their life is transformed, just so you know, that's Jesus Christ giving the dead life. The dead are still being raised all the time. So trust God is moving and working. And so this miracle happened. So what happened? So they're released and they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. They went to their What's it say? They went to their what? They went to their friends. So well, let's just stop this whole thing, I like you, but I don't love you bit. What were they doing? They went to their friends because they were friends. They were friends. That's all them people that have been getting saved. That's, all, that's their church. That's the other disciples. That's the 120. It doesn't tell us who was there. It just says their friends were there. So they talked about it with their friends and their friends are helping them. They're helping them. They're being accountable to their friends. They're helping them by praying for them. Look what happens. They tell them everything that happened. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. So the first thing they do, tell them all these things. And what do all their friends say? Let's pray. Let's pray. They did not say, let's march. Let's go fight for our rights down there at, uh, at the temple area. We have rights as Jewish men to go wherever we want. <coughs> nope. They went and told their friends and they prayed and they prayed and they, and they prayed together. They lifted their voices together and said in, in unity. It doesn't mean they're praying the same words, but all those people together trusted God. Look what the words they say. Sovereign Lord who made heaven and earth and everything in them. That sounds exactly like what Peter's talking about in 1 Peter, right? That Jesus was able to endure the suffering and the things that he went through by trusting in his father. I'm in my father's hands. And then he calls us to do the same. So they pray, okay, God, we're in your hands. We're in your hands. When you listen to the prayer that they pray, listen to it. Who through the mouth of our father, David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit. Hey, this is Psalm two. Why do the Gentiles rage? Why do the nations rage? Is the world in opposition against God and the people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers are gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. <clears throat> Why is the whole world in such opposition to us? That's what Psalm 2 is all about. But listen to what he declares. 
For truly in this city, he's talking about Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, you made Christ. He's the anointed one. When he ascended and sat by the Father, the Lord declares to him, you are my son today, I've begotten you. That's an enthronement psalm. He, seated, he sat Jesus on the throne of God and he declared, you're the king. He's the anointed one. He's the Christ, the one whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Who were the Gentiles involved in his crucifixion? Well, the Romans for sure, right? And the nation of Israel's cast him up, they rejected him. And all these people are working to crucify the Lord. But look at verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined take place. What's he declaring? He's declaring this. Jesus, your anointed, the Christ, the king of all the universe, was in your hands. He trusted you and you walked him through this. This was God's plan. God's plan was that Jesus would be crucified, dead, buried, rise again, ascend into heaven and sit on the throne. Amen? Amen. That's God's plan. That's the plan. That's the only way by which you and I can be saved. This is his plan. And so they're saying in their prayer, Lord, you are sovereign and all the things that have happened have happened according to your plan. And ultimately we trust you. We are giving ourselves to your hands. It's their Gethsemane moment. It's their time where they're saying, look, whatever comes, whatever's happening. Now look, Lord, they're threatening us now. They're threatening us. Their threats, their grant, uh, look upon their threats and grant your servants, what? Deliver us from their hands. Is that what they prayed? Get us away from them, Lord. Don't let them say bad things to us. Don't let them be mean to us. God, don't let us ever go through any suffering. Is that what he prayed? No, he didn't ask that. What he said was, Lord, make us bold. Help us speak the word. When it's time to speak the word, they already were okay with whatever happened because they're in God's hands. Today, is that where you are? Are you okay with whatever God walks you through? Sometimes it's harder than others, isn't it? For sure. Look, I get it's hard. I get it's hard. And we just prayed this morning for those who are suffering in cancer, right? Trust yourself into God's hands. That he be glorified. And that this would accomplish your good. That's what the word, they already trust it. Already trust it. The prayer that we're praying here is, Lord, help us continue to be a witness for you. I was in a, <clears throat> I was in a hospital room with my pastor, my pastor, Gerald Hagerman. His wife today is Marilee, but back then her name was Cindy. She had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. My wife and I and Gerald were in the hospital when the diagnosis come through. They had a little uh, chalkboard, not a chalkboard, marker board or whatever you call that, whiteboard on the wall. You guys have been in a hospital room, you've seen those. And Cindy's prayer with pancreatic cancer, which no, nobody usually survives. Her prayer was, help me be a good witness of you. That's the prayer in Acts 4. And she was a good witness. She was a good witness. She was a good witness for a year. They told her she just had weeks. But she was a good witness for a year. She glorified the Lord. And there were many, many, many good times in that last year. And then there was a day where she went to be with Jesus. And was sad for us, but not for her. She prayed. Let me be a witness. They're praying, let us continue to speak your word with boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. God, you heal who you want to heal. We'll, we'll, we're here, we're tools, right? 
I don't know when God's going to heal, so I'm going to pray for healing for everybody. I'm not afraid. Why do I got to be afraid? It's okay to ask for healing. It's okay. Don't be afraid. But what if God doesn't heal? That's not your job. Is that your job? Does it say anywhere when you pray for healing, figure out whether or not God's going to do it? No, just says pray for healing. Anoint with oil, the prayer of faith. And so this is how we want to respond. This is how we respond to that. He will stretch out his hand and heal. Signs and wonders will be performed through your name, the holy servant. And when they had prayed this, the whole place they were in was shook. Because when God's people are gathered together in one accord, in unity, crying out to the Lord with one voice, God's there. Just like he was in the temple. Now he is in the hearts and lives of his church gathered together. And so they're gathered together. The whole place shook. Boom. And they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. So just like second chapter of Acts, this is the same same. Same uh, uh, words being used. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. I thought they already had the Holy Spirit. What they did? They got more. That's what it says, right? They're filled with the Holy Spirit and he gave them boldness. A lot of people don't talk about that spiritual gift. We talk about a lot of other spiritual gifts. There's more flair sparks but when they prayed and were filled with the holy spirit what the holy spirit made them was bold to speak the word where it needed to be spoke now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul look at that unity look at that unity within the body they're one heart one soul no one said that anything they had belonged to them because their hearts were transformed. They didn't care much, as much about their stuff. So if somebody needs stuff, they get, the, you know, the, if your heart is chained, if your heart is focused on your stuff, you're going to be selfish. Nope, you can't use this. When, when Randy's Jeep was broke down and they needed a car, I gave them my car. And they used my car for until they got the Jeep fixed, which was way too long. But, <coughs> but they, but they, amen. I, I, hopefully, if you're, if the mechanic's here today, sorry. But it took them a long time. But praise God, because you know what? My stuff doesn't matter more than them. And I, I, it didn't, it, I was able. I'm able to do it. Praise God. Right? So the idea is your stuff, when your life is transforming, your change is not about your stuff no more. Look, we're Americans and we got way too much stuff. I got a Harley. Last time I said these words, God hit me with a truck. But if the Lord wants that Harley, he can have it. If somebody needs that Harley, they can use it. You test me today. Walk up to me and say, Jackie, let me take it for a spin and see if I don't toss you to fob. See if I don't. If I don't, beat me in the parking lot. <laughs> no one said anything belonged to them. They had everything in common. This is not a statement about communism or economics or this is what happens in the body of Christ when Christ has transformed hearts and you care more about one another than you care about your stuff. That's, what, that's all it is. Don't go crazy. That's what it is. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them. Anybody need great grace? Yes. Hallelujah. And there was not a needy one among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what they sold, laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each one as they have a need. You know what the word declares? Paul wrote in Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches. What are his riches? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. My stuff's just on loan from God to me. Amen? We'll talk about that some more because next week we're going to get into some nitty gritty. Right? We're going to look at Acts chapter 5 next week. But 
But this week, what do we want to hold on to? Hey, you entrust yourself into the hands of God Almighty, and he, he's got you. Whatever you got to walk, he'll give you what you need to walk it. He's your healer. He's your strengthener. And he will help you be the witness God's calling you to be for whatever we're going through. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand with me? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for this time. We can gather together. We can look in, the, in your book. This is the word of God. And your book declares, Lord, how you would have us walk how you would have us behave. Lord, I pray as we go through this week and we consider your word day by day, moment by moment, we spend time in your word, we spend time in prayer, we seek your face. As we do that, Lord, you, you show us, Lord, individually in those areas where I'm not entrusting myself into the hands of he who is faithful. He who is good. And sometimes he who is faithful and he who is good will bring me through the valley of the shadow of death. But I will fear no evil. Why? You are with me. So God, I pray we, we, we recognize that. And I pray we, alongside all of those disciples, can pray, Lord, help us be witnesses to you with boldness with faith in the one to whom we belong. For we have committed ourselves to Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the power that I walk in and talk in and do things in is the power he gave me. I am not my own. I have been bought with a price. So, Lord God, help us be the witnesses you're calling us to be. Not afraid. We want what you want. You're, you're in charge, not me. How you want to do it, the way you want to do it, it's all you, God. We trust you. We put our hope in you. Walk us through this season of life that is so weird in our world. Help us be your witnesses to a world that has rejected you and is hostile towards you. Help us be your witnesses to our family that doesn't want to walk with you. Help us be your witnesses to our neighbors that don't know you. Help us be the witnesses you have called us to be. And help us trust you the whole way, whatever it costs, because I'm in the hands of my king. So whether it is right that we obey this land or God Almighty, you decide, but I cannot but speak and share what I have seen and heard. God, be glorified in your people today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.